E na mana e na reo, e o reo rangatira mā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So, a year ago, I sat in a doctor's office in North Shore Hospital, and the doctor told me that I had less than a year to live. And so, I basically did what anyone would do in those circumstances. I went straight down to Harvey Norman, bought a whole lot of stuff on two-year interest-free terms. <laughs> um, yeah, but as you can see, I lived, uh, uh, and now I've got two lounge suites I don't really need, so <laughs> come and see me afterwards. But my story started in uh, December 2016, and I, I was making my New Year's resolutions, and I made two resolutions. I decided I wanted to lose 10 kilos in weight, and I wanted to see a lot more of my friends and family. Uh, well, I, I guess you've got to be really careful what you wish for, because just a few weeks later, I weighed myself, and I'd already lost five kilos. And a few weeks after that, I weighed myself, and I'd lost 12 kilos. And I was feeling quite tired and listless, but I felt like I had a mild flu. And so I did what anyone do, would do. I basically ignored it. All good men would ignore something like that. Until my wife started saying to you, you should really go and see a doctor, David. Go and see a doctor. Go and see a doctor. And finally, against my better judgment, I went and saw a doctor. And it was very lucky that I did, because what I thought was a mild case of the flu turned out to be a pretty serious case of the cancer. And I had a really significant and large tumour about the size of a basketball uh, all squished around me. And I must have had it for about a year or more. So that was the beginning of what turned out to be about 18 months of a really amazing roller coaster ride that I want to tell you about. And I learned sort of three key lessons uh, that I'll tell you. For me, um, getting cancer was really an unexpected thing. I was really busy at work and at home and at life, and I had lots of things going on. I didn't have time to have cancer, it kind of wasn't in my plans. Um, and when the doctor said to me, uh, actually, this is going to take a while, David, you're going to have to go through at least six months worth of chemotherapy, uh, I thought, oh my God, I can't do it. I can't wrap my head around taking six months out of life to basically go through chemotherapy. It just feels like this enormous mountain to climb. And my, uh, one of my children, Joshua, said to me, Dad, remember that story about how do you eat an elephant? And I said, no, no, Joshua. And he said, well, you start, and that's it. You just have to start. And so I had no choice. I found myself basically in hospital uh, the next day and starting my chemotherapy regime. And I learned a lot through that. First of all, I learned that hospitals are strange places. They're full of weird noises and weird smells and unfamiliar things. People putting tubes into you and lines and strange chemicals and, and words you don't understand. And after a while, you find yourself sort of retreating into this kind of internal uh, space and this mode of being a patient. And even the words that are used about you, you talk about suffering, you talk about that you are sick, that you are ill, that you're infirm, and all those words started to have this real impact on me, and I found myself assuming the position of a patient and kind of narrowing my perspective on life, and I really didn't like it. I really hated that feeling of being a victim in this whole scenario, and I decided with my wife that we needed to really change it up, because I, I couldn't change the fact I had to be in the hospital room for weeks and weeks and weeks. Had no choice. I couldn't even leave because of the chemicals that I was on. Um, but what I could do was pretend. And so we decided I would pretend I was on holiday. And so the first week, we went to Fiji, <laughs> which was really cool. Uh, after that, we started going different, more exotic places. Paris, we went to. My, my sister did a, an art exhibition in Paris while we were there. It was very good. And as you can see, my friends, my visitors, my family all started uh, dressing up and going along with the theme. Uh, even the hospital staff got into it. So one of the guys on the slide is actually the CEO of the hospital who'd heard what we were doing, and he came to find out all about it. It was a really cool thing. So every week we changed the theme, and we had a different holiday destination. Uh, Mexico, it was just amazing. And even um, uh, my visitors and the doctors and nurses got into it. They used to come into my room and say, where are we going this week? And one of my visitors, Glenn, who's there in the green suit, uh, came into the bottom of the hospital, and the, and the reception person said, ah, oh, you'll be here to see Mr. Downs. He's on Ward 10. <laughs> It was a really cool thing to do, uh, and it made me really learn a lot about something. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't change the fact that I had to be in hospital. That was just something that was going to happen to me. And I couldn't change the fact that I had cancer at that point. Um, but I learned that I, I couldn't choose my room, but I could definitely choose my attitude. And for me, that was a really powerful, kind of empowering concept, that I had control over something. Another lesson I had, I had to learn was that after that six months worth of chemotherapy, unfortunately, I went to see the doctor, and that's when the doctor said to me, 
David, it, it didn't really work. Uh, we got rid of some of the tumour, but actually other tumours have, have kicked in, and now you've got more cancer in different places, and frankly, we, we don't know how to treat you anymore, and we're not sure uh, what to do next, and, and this is when she told me that I was terminal. And that was obviously a really, uh, a really tough thing to hear, because I'd been hearing this again and again, the cancer kept coming back, I had no options. And people said to me at the time, how did you put up with that? How, you know, how do you have that kind of mental stamina and resilience? And it made me think a lot about resilience, actually, this whole last 18 months. Because for me, there was multi there's multiple sort of metaphors of resilience. One metaphor of resilience is this idea of a lighthouse in the ocean, you know, and you're seeing these pictures of these storms slamming against the lighthouse, but the lighthouse is there sort of steadfast and nothing can touch it. And I thought that's not a very good metaphor, actually, because eventually that lighthouse will just fall over. And that didn't feel to me like, like the right metaphor. Another metaphor for, for resilience is kind of a non-stick fry pan. This is, other people said to me, yeah, nothing can touch me. I'm, you know, I'm, out, I'm sliding, I'm sliding, nothing touches me. But again, I didn't think that was true either because um, after a while, non-stick fire pans get scratched and even you can get cancer off them. So be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a good metaphor. For me, a better metaphor, thinking about over the last year, because the other thing about this is they deny your very humanity. They, they try and pretend that it doesn't affect you. And the reality is, of course, it affects you when you hear news like this, news that you've got cancer, news that you have to have chemotherapy, that, it, that the cancer is terminal. Of course, it impacted me. Human beings are, are emotional creatures. We're, we're big bags of chemicals walking around, you know. Things affect us. So for me, a better metaphor is this idea of a sort of a memory foam pillow. You know, you push on it, it definitely has an impression. That impression lasts a little while, and then over time it just sort of disappears and you come back to some sort of normality. And that was what it felt like for me. It gave me permission. This metaphor gave me permission to really have an impact. There were days when I just cried. There were days when I, um, my family was feeling really down. But I knew that I would come back. I knew that I would reach back to our normal state and that something would happen. So my next lesson, my second lesson, is that resilience doesn't mean resistance. That's not human, that's not normal, it's something different. The third lesson I learned going through cancer uh, requires me to tell you a quick background story. So a few years ago, I applied for a job, a really you know, high-powered job. It's like a vice president, a uh, senior regional person. I'd already done five or six job interviews, and I was going to go to the final job interview with the head guy, the head of this particular uh, division, and it was a very important interview for me to put up my suit a whole bit sat in his office and he said, David, I've only got one question for you, and that is this, very important job. He said, David, when you're driving to the airport and you're running late, do the traffic lights go green or red? And I thought, what a strange, what a strange question. Uh, this is a really important job. And uh, I thought about it for a while, and I said, well, actually, uh, they go green, actually. Yeah, pretty much they always go green. I've, I've never missed a flight because of the traffic lights. And he said, thank you very much. Uh, you've got the job, I don't want to hire someone who's unlucky. <laughs> and I, I thought about that quite a lot over the last year, about this role of luck. Because what I'm going to tell you next, it seems to involve an enormous amount of luck. Catherine and I decided, Catherine's my wife by the way, uh, we decided that early on we were going to be participants in our own rescue. I wanted to, this is this idea of being in control. I wanted to understand everything about the cancer, understand everything about the treatment and what we could do about it. We were going to participate in our own rescue. And that involved an enormous amount of work and reading. This is Catherine reading articles and articles and articles online about the type of cancer I had, lymphoma, and what we could do about it and what were the potential treatments. And particularly when the cancer came back, what were the other options that are out there in the world that we could, that we could potentially go after? And with our doctor's help, we discovered a, a potential treatment for us, which is an immune therapy treatment called CAR T-cell therapy. And CAR T-cell therapy involves taking out uh, some of the blood, genetically re-engineering it in a lab, like genetically modifying it, putting it back in so it can recognize the cancer, and then those new genetically modified cells fight the cancer. When we found out about that, we were going, that's the one for us, particularly when um, we found out that it was exactly for my type of cancer. The problem was it wasn't available in New Zealand. So we talked to our doctor and she said, well, it might be available in five or 10 years, but it's just not here yet. We, we just don't have the option for you here, unfortunately. And that's when another piece of luck came in. I'd been writing all the time that I had cancer. I was writing columns for, a, for an online newspaper and I'd written about 60 of these columns. So I was really putting my story out there and I was getting lots of feedback and input and, and, and feedback from people. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. One day I got an email from someone who'd read one of my columns 
who wasn't a Kiwi. He was based in New York, and he wrote me this really nice email, and it says basically, David, I've been reading your story. If there's anything I can ever do to help you, let me know. And I was curious. I looked him up. He turned out to be the head of immunology uh, at one of the big drug companies in the US who just happened to come to New Zealand on holiday 20 years ago. And he likes our newspapers, so he reads them. <laughs> and he reached out to me like this. And so I jumped on that, and I said, yes, actually, thank you, Mike. His name's Mike. Um, you can help me. And I explained what had happened, and now we were no, told I was terminal. There were no options for us in New Zealand. And within 48 hours, he had put us in touch with some researchers at Harvard University in Boston. And they had put us in touch with some doctors. And we found ourselves in conversations with those doctors about me going on a clinical trial in Boston for the very CAR-T therapy that we had been reading about. This incredible twist of events. So from the absolute low of being told I was terminal with cancer to this amazing high of potentially this option of saving my own life, it was incredible. To then all of a sudden I got an email from the hospital's billing department <laughs> who told me, dear Mr. Downs, very nice to have you on the trial. By the way, it could cost you a million dollars. A million US dollars, plus my travel and accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. So suddenly, and I didn't have a million dollars. <laughs> no one really does. So we were really in this pretty bad situation again, back to the down lows again of, oh my God, we can't afford to get on this clinical trial. It's going to cost us a fortune. So I, again, I thought, what can I do here? What, how can I be in control? So um, I picked up the phone. We had a chat with the billing department. I said, excuse me, uh, any discount for cash? <laughs> And they said, yes, actually, we'll give you 25% discount for cash. So I thought, that's pretty good. That's already knocked off 250,000 bucks. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, it's only 750,000 US dollars now. So I said to them, thank you very much. Could you please maybe give me a detailed estimate, just a breakdown, complete break detail about how you come up with that number? And they said, yes, and then they sent me that. <laughs> Which is... I was very pleased to see the surcharge was, was, was included. <laughs> so again, not really much help, because in, my, in our um, money here in New Zealand, this was still going to cost me about a million and a half dollars by the time we did it all. So again, we didn't have that money, um, and we had a chat about it as a family, and we decided what we could do is we could sell our house. You know, we own part of our house with the bank. We'll put our house on the market. So we put our house on the market, getting ready to, uh, to sell it. And this was all happening, by the way, in a matter of days and hours. Like, it was just after I'd been told I was terminal. Some friends of, them, of mine, this is where another piece of luck comes in, decided they didn't want to see me sell my house. They didn't want to see me go down that route. And they decided to put on a, a kind of a fundraising, crowd fundraising campaign, which was incredible. And I felt very humbled, as did my family, for the money that came in. And then I had another group of friends who are comedians who decided they would put on a show for me, and they did this big stand-up show uh, here in Auckland about a year ago today, actually, and they raised another bunch of money. And then suddenly, while we didn't have all the money we needed, we have a substantial part of it, enough to actually negotiate with the hospital, and I got myself to Boston, I got myself on the clinical trial, and uh, about eight, nine months ago, uh, that little vial of liquid there was put into me, and that contains genetically modified CAR T cells. 28 days later, they did another scan and they said, David, you're in complete remission. 100%. Thank you. So that roller coaster journey has just led me to think back about that uh, job interview I did all those years ago when the, the traffic lights story. And I realized. I realized, of course, that my boss wasn't really asking me if I was lucky, because the traffic lights don't go green or red any more or less often for me than anybody else. It's just, it's just random luck. What he was asking me was, how do I perceive the world? Do I perceive to be lucky? Do I perceive that things go in my favor? And I, I firmly believe uh, that I'm an optimist and that things are generally going to work out well for me. And I've discovered that over time, believing that actually makes it happen. Uh, so for me, the third big lesson I learned from cancer was that hard work and perception is luck. And for me, uh, that has made a massive difference to my life. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is, uh, of course, I, I go back to life as normal, but it's never normal. And I, think, I thought to myself, how can I, what can I do now to pay it back or pay it forward, actually, for all the help that I was given and the, and the things that happened to me along the way? And I discovered that right here in New Zealand, there's a research institute in Wellington who's working on the exact same CAR T cell therapy uh, that I had in Boston, here in New Zealand, years and years ahead of where we thought they would be. 
and they are working now to do a clinical trial in New Zealand. So I said to them, how can I help? And they said, well, tell people about what we're doing and help us raise funds. So I've joined with um, the, the Maligan Institute in Wellington, and we have a campaign called downwithcancer.nz, uh, and we'd love your support. Down With Cancer will bring uh, CAR T-cell therapy to other people here in New Zealand so that people like me, and there's three or four others now in New Zealand, won't have to go to other parts of the world for their cancer treatment. And over time, this will be applied to many different types of cancer, and we hopefully will have uh, a cure for cancer within our grasp. So I'd love you to join with me, downwithcancer.nz. Nō uh, my name is David Downs. I'm a GMO, a genetically modified optimist. Thanks very much. <laughs>